That's enough out of you already! I did not hire all of you who are to be the best of the best and come in here and just waste my time for something that's very important that we get done and we've only got 30 seconds left to do it. Now, will one of you people please tell me what it is we are here for? Anybody? Yes, sir. We are here to decide how we're going to do the disclaimer for the Topic Hour episode and be sure to do it professionally up to the standards of the Dub Talk podcast. But, sir, we've already done over a hundred episodes of Dub Talk right now and I, I just think we've done every single possible way that we can do a disclaimer is the only thing. I, I'm not trying to throw you off, sir. I'm, I'm just, I don't know how else we could do this. Thank you. Hey, fine, somebody gets it. What's your name? Noah Clue, sir. Well, I thought his name was Noah. Actually, sir, I'm Noah. Well, I thought his name was Noah. No, no, no he's no. Noah. And he's Noah. Oh, good grief. It's, they all look the same. How am I supposed to tell you them apart? Uh, um, sir, if, if I may make just one suggestion. Yes, you! I think most of our audience already knows the disclaimer at this point, so why don't we just have someone say it off, you know, like, like, like you know, just tell them what the thing is and then move on to the episode. Oh really, would you like to take a crack at saying it then? No sir, please, please don't make me do it! Oh, okay, so really, you just want me to, what, you know, just go up to the board here and just do it all myself, fine, it's possible, I gotta do everything myself around here, I gotta we even pay you people for anyways. All right, let's do this. Wait, uh, how, how does it start again? What, what, what's the one? What, how, how do we start it out? Like, it's, it's, I, I forget. I, I think it starts out like uh, warning the dub talk. Yes, exactly. Podcast. That's it. Okay, warning the dub talk podcast may contain language that is not suitable for younger salary men. Listener discretion is advised. Sorry, I got the wrong room. Is it too late for the meeting? Also, there's always the possibility that spoilers could occur for any and all anime being discussed. So if we're watching or talking about a series that you've started but you haven't finished yet, be on your guard. And finally, one thing I want to make absolutely clear, any and all opinions that we express throughout this entire episode are the opinions of the individual participants and do not respect the Dub Talk Corporation as a whole. So. If any of you guys make opinions out there, No, sir. It may not represent the company as a whole. Yes, sir. I knew we'd do it. All right, I think that's a wrap, boys. Awesome! So we get everything cleaned up, and let's go bowling. Who's with me? Awesome! Welcome to another episode of Dumb Talk, a show where a bunch of nerds get together and talk about a recent dub or dub announcement. Today, we present to you a tale of woe. Mr. Tonegawa Middle Management Blues. Today, we've got a little bit of a... God, I have wanted to talk about something involving this franchise <laughs> since I joined this show. I have been pestering every anime licensor and distributor for at least eight or nine years. Hey, you guys gonna get a Kagi or Kaiji? You gonna get a Kagi or Kaiji? Well, unfortunately, we're not talking about a Kagi or Kaiji today. What? We're talking about the spin-off, Mr. Tonegawa, Middle Management Blues. But you probably want to know who I've gathered to talk about this particular show that I have wanted so, so long to get a dub. Mook number one, why don't you introduce yourself? Sir, my name is Amon. I wear a black suit and I like bowling. Mook number two. Hi, my name is Jet and I like bowling. Oh, uh, okay, um, mook number three. Sir, yes sir, my name is Noah Clue, and I like sky No, nah, I'm just kidding, I like bowling. Ah, uh, a lot of fun you guys are. Bunch of gutter balls. 
<laughs> it's the name of our bowling team. How'd you know that? <laughs> Can, can, can we get like like visible woo woo signs in the background of the podcast? Woo woo But you guys probably want to know what Mr. Tonagawa is about, so I have provided with me a description from Anime News Network. The Teiai Group is one of Japan's largest firms. Yukio Tonegawa, a man with larger-than-life presence and sharp intellect, works as the right-hand man of Chairman Kazutaka Hiyodo. One day, the chairman commands Tonegawa to spearhead Game of Death, an evil project that employs debtors. He rallies his direct reports and scrambles to form Team Tonegawa, only to encounter a barrage of challenges from the erratic chairman and his disloyal employees, Ultimate leading to his demotion. Yeah, and uh, if you're curious as to where this lies in the timeline of Kaiji proper, this is basically setting up the plot to actual Kaiji. <laughs> yeah, it, it's alluded to in the first episode and throughout that this all takes place before Tonegawa encounters um, aforementioned pointy nose man. And for the sake of this episode, I'm going to try to avoid spoilers of Kaiji as much as I can. Which is good because some of us in this podcast had and still have less than zero knowledge about Kaiji at this point of recording. Hmm, yeah. Alright, so are we ready to begin? We should probably point out something interesting. We're, we're trying something a little different in this episode, aren't we? Because this is part of a new project that our good friends at Sentai Filmworks are trying out, isn't it? Oh, that's right! Uh, this for... is a brand new project! <laughs> Get out the PowerPoint! In all seriousness, um, this is part of Sentai Filmworks' new dubcast initiative, which started back in April or May. Uh, the spring season, basically. It is more or less Sentai Filmworks in conjunction with High Dive dubbing anime two to five weeks after their Japanese broadcast. Yes, the fine folks in Houston have finally joined in the simul dub craze that is sweeping the nation. Which means that we do not have to wait, uh, you know, a long time to get our dubs. Because, as is pointed out in the Evolution of Anime Dubbing panel that we host, we are greedy little gremlins and we like our dubs ASAP. Bring it to us now! I want pictures of Spider-Man on my desk! Now! <laughs> uh, I mean, you may not... It's I want dubs for Sentai Filmworks on my desk! Now! Uh, have you been playing the Spider-Man PS4 game like everybody else, Roots? Not yet. I don't have uh, it yet. Uh, it's gonna take me at least a week or two to get that game. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm in the middle of Yakuza 2 Kiwami Hill. I can't play that. So, somebody put a picture uh, up on Twitter that it was a picture from The Simpsons of it was Homer in a bar and everyone around him has like Spider Man logos on his face and he's the only one without it. And it's like, <laughs> you're feeling when you're the only one who hasn't played Spider Man on PS4. Yeah, I'll get around to it eventually. I'm. Yeah, As of recording, I... working on Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth, a game from two, three years ago. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say, right, I'd say right now, Spider-Man, and eventually Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise are on my to get pile, so... <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Speaking of games, we should probably get to the show that's all about gambling. Yes. That's not what Let we're watching. Begin... <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I mean, it's a firm that is, is reaped in people who have gotten into debt through gambling. Yeah, so but, they, yeah, get, yeah but that, that's not the version we're talking about. Yeah. Unfortunately, no. Get on that, Sentai Filmworks. In any case, let us begin with our ADR staff. Um, gentlemen, did any of you have predictions? Uh, not at all, weirdly. I mean, not so weird because um, I, I almost didn't either because I, I know some of the staff for Sentai Filmworks, but I f it felt a little advantageous to guess who would be available for uh, the simul dub project. Like, who yeah. would be available on a week to week basis? Yeah, I, I mean, okay, I mean, my thing is, I would make predictions, but then it would, but then there's literally only two characters I care about because they're in Kaiji proper, so it's like, 
there wasn't much point to me. <laughs> so not not even trying to take a guess at who would direct and write this. As as I mean as I mean there's like I mean there's only really a couple of options to be honest. So. And that is true, and that that is why I made my prediction for the director. Um, at, you're right, Jeff. There's only a couple of well-known Sentai directors, so if it's not one, it's either the other. So um, I, I bet you'll all be surprised about this, but um, I, I put down Kyle Colby Jones as my prediction for the director. Okay. Shock, visible shocks from the audience, like, no, you fool! That would never happen! Sawa, Sawa! <laughs> Sawa. And, and then for uh, for writers, um, I, I went through, um, like, okay, what, what's a Sentai dub that I've watched recently and I know have uh, writers and staff from, like, because a lot of my knowledge of the Houston staff is, like, people from the ADV days. So I'm like, okay, I got to pick something from a more recent production. So I went through the Food Wars staff uh, from the episode we did on that, and I just guessed George Manley and Marta Bechtel, who were the main writers on that series. Okay. okay. Amon, did you have anything? Uh, no, unfortunately. My my knowledge of the Sentai actor-director pool is still kind of not very good for the same reason Noah mentioned. Most of the stuff I know from Houston is, like, ADV stuff. Uh, so no. Okay. What about yourself, Roots? Uh, so, for ADR director, I had kind of thought to another one of Sentai Filmworks' uh, dubcasts. From last Ooh. season, uh, Dereku the Animation, because tonally it felt a little similar to Kaiji, minus the, the whole, like, sex thing, but, like, games where people do things more or less against their will, that, that kind of, kind of felt like an underlying theme. So I mm -hmm. went with that show's director, aka John Swayze. Ah. And mm. because the the tone of the show kind of took a very comedic turn. I needed to think of somebody who had some decent comedic timing who worked for Sentai. And like, off the top of my head, I thought of Clint Bickham. Yeah, yeah, that would fit. Well, in case you... <laughs> in case if you guys didn't... <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have Aiden pulled up right game, now... Uh, you will come to realize that one of us is right and the other is not. Uh, the director for Mr. Tonegawa, Middle Management Blues, is none other than Kyle Jones. The big cheese! Uh, you would know such directorial roles from Kyle Jones as A Comic A Kill, Parasite the Maxim, Food Wars, both seasons, uh, the short film compilation Short Piece... And my love story. Uh, we didn't, however, get the script writers correct. Either of us. Mm, uh, Kyle, sure? Kyle Jones, in this case, is pulling double duty. Um, you would know his script writing work from stuff such as... Uh, Chiafru, Haikyuu, Log Horizon, and No Game No Life. And he was assisted by Marta Bechtel. Oh, you did mention. I did mention Marta Bechtel. Okay. My and by, bad. by the way, it's um, it was it's pronounced Chihayafuru. Chihayafuru. Sorry, I I get that one mixed up like all the time. Yeah, understandable. But you would know uh, you would know Marta's script writing from such shows as Anonymous Noise, the Beyond the Boundary movies, Devil's Line, and Food Wars. Uh, so what did you guys think of the direction and script writing? Let's start with you, Amon. Comedy dub of the year. At least so far. This is great. I love it. This is hysterical. Uh, I'm really, I, as you may guess, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I have, I have basically no, I have no prior experience with anything related to Kaiji. I know it's about a man who gambles a lot, and there's a lot of peril. Uh, so I went into this basically blind, and I have been having so much fun with this. It is so ludicrous and silly, and uh, Kyle Covey Jones has done just a wonderful job of bringing all that out. In terms of, like, direction, casting, how they're adapting the script. Uh, this has been a hoot. This has turned me into a fan. 
basically. Uh, I can't sing its praises enough at the moment. It's I've been. It's just so good. Now, I don't have any. Did, did you know mm -hmm. anything about Kaiji before going into this, Amon? It's about a pointy-nosed man who does gambling. So no, that nothing is, that about is the tone or the. the I got the sense it was kind of over the top, but not in any particular like. Like I don't know if it was like oh. funny over the top or just sort of ridiculous in general or what. Kaiji, without spoiling too much, is like over the top bleak. Ah, okay. yeah, that, that that would make sense. Yeah, it, the other, it, other... It, like it, like it is. No, I will say this was it is one of the few anime that has genuinely terrified me. Like, like <laughs> if you that if you think just of because the <clears throat> if you think of Kaiji as something akin to like. Uh, let's pull a recent example. The Purge? Oh, um, dear. <laughs> Mr. Tonegawa, by contrast, is more of a Bob Roberts. I see. I get you. That is not where I thought you were going with the analogy. <laughs> but like, I get you. I get it. Like, Kaiji as a franchise leans very, very far to the left politically. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have guessed that from watching this. And no three Bob. <laughs> and as you can tell, like Mr. Tonagawa takes that interpretation on a more comedic on a more comedic loop. But in any case, um Jet, what is your opinion on the direction in script writing? Okay, um so so I came into this show as a fan of Kaiji, and uh, this is uh, pretty totally different from that. So, I was actually a little bit off, but when I tried watching the first episode of Japanese, I was totally sure I was going to feel about the dub. Um, but, I mean, I've been enjoying it so far. Um, Carl Kobe Jones is pretty good at comedy, and uh, he has a comedic timing down for this pretty well. I mean, a lot, like, a lot of jokes work. The delivery is pretty solid. I mean, not, I was like, eh, not everything always hits, but when it does, it's pretty funny, and, uh... Okay, well I, would, well, well, I wouldn't say I'm, like, blown away by this show. I mean, I've been pretty amused by it. And uh, it definitely has me curious how he'd handle an actual kaiju dub. I I feel like he could probably do that, so hopefully he gets to. Noah? Um, I came into this with, uh, out even knowing that it was uh, related to kaiju. Um, I just, like, turned on the first episode and sub, um, only knowing the art style, which um, I should have recognized as similar to kaiju because it's got that similar dark, black outline and very cartoonish not very anime looking style to it so uh as far as the dubs uh actual content i uh was really amazed because this is a very um uh okay i, I expected something more like a gretzko going into what the actual content would be like um something that would um kind of mock the uh the capitalist cutthroat you work and you are devoted to the company kind of japanese mentality and um, because I thought it was going to be a lot bleaker and a lot drier of humor, but the dub uh, by uh, Kyle and Marta uh, t gives a lot of respect. Like, it doesn't mock the characters. None of the characters are given, like, an overly cartoonish voice, um, except for one we'll, we'll talk about who is supposed to be cartoonish. But all the characters have, like, kind of normal-sounding voices to them, and they're all directed to uh, read the material without making fun of it you know th th they're not uh, spoofing it this isn't a ghost stories kind of dub where you could easily throw in jokes we're not supposed to be i feel like this is uh, very faithful to what the original japanese had written down which is uh commendable because a lot of the humor in this is going to lean upon your knowledge of how japanese treats its workers or at least in the hardcore business uh the corporate business world like, if any of you guys have, uh, know anything about American business, you think it's, like, like The Office, probably? You know, like, the TV show The Office, where you can get away with a lot of, uh, goofy shenanigans? This one is more like, uh, all the company workers are super loyal to the company. They all dress the same. They're all supposed to act the same. They're scared to speak up. They're, like, life and death, almost, in how they treat, uh, their boss, who kind of holds their balls in his hands. And this dub really uh paints it like uh we're, we're gonna make we're gonna have some fun with that we're gonna play around the conventions of it we're going to have super visual puns that overemphasize everything 
and really, even if you don't understand the Japanese culture part of it, you can probably enjoy the dub just fine. It's perfectly accessible to a um, an American or a Western audience. Nice. Uh, so I just need to say, I am so glad that Sentai that that we are getting a screwball comedy dub out of Houston again. <laughs> like, I, I've got to say, back in the days of ADV, they were one of the best people at it. Mm-hmm. With, L with Like, things... you think, like, one show that was, like, the prime example of that? I would say the prime example would be something along the lines of Cromarty High School or, like, Azumanga Dayo. Yeah. Not quite ghost stories. Ghost Stories was a great dub, don't get me wrong, but that's not quite what what we're talking about here. That was more or less of a parody dub that, ju that just lampooned the hell out of, like, a show that wasn't necessarily a comedy. But in any case, I just... I just love how the jokes were pretty well readapted for American listeners... They still delivered great punchlines, despite aspects of it not quite working the same way as the original Japanese. And each of the individual performances were really good. Like, we're not going over a lot of the of the black suits today. What? For for this episode, we're only going to be covering two standalone, but 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 but, but I had notes about all eleven of them right here. <laughs> I, I have like these, these super. I have one hundred po detail points on my PowerPoint presentation. But roots, they're also distinct and memorable. How can we not talk about every single one individually? <laughs> <laughs> you told us we were going to go all night on this one. Um, unfortunately, like no offense to the actors, but the. The characters themselves are sort of designed to blend into the background until their specific character is needed. And just as a disclaimer, we're only covering up to episodes one through four. So that that's part mm -hmm. of that. But, like, everybody, like, the dialogue snaps together so well. They're, they're great comebacks. They're great. Like, earlier in the episode, I referenced an entire joke from that from the first episode and like there are more where that comes from it, mean, it's... like the idea that that japanese corporate office workers all have like very similar hobbies after work more pretty much and the best part about this is it, it's sort of a similar situation to um uh hinamatsuri from last season from funimation where it, this is basically a show about a bunch of thugs. And it just plays around with the idea of... Of, like, being a professional black suit. And it just makes complete fun of it. And, like, it, it's... It's so good! It's so good. <laughs> like, I, I'm talking words around it, but it's just... It's so good. Now I have to ask, Roots. Do, do you think that your uh, that your high praise of this is slightly elevated by the fact that you were already a super fan of the show that it's a spinoff of from to begin with? It helps. I mean, I, I, I mean, like I'm a pretty big kind of fan. This is mostly like okay to me, so I wouldn't think so. <laughs> no, I, I get that. <laughs> I, I wanted to know that, which I'm glad, Jet, that you came to this knowing more about the fran about Kate Kaiji. It Kaiji. Uh, because I was in a similar situation of reception of the show itself, where it's like, it, it was good, but it didn't quite grab me as much as, um, like, like Roots is giving it, like, the high, high praise there. And I'm like, okay, all right, all right. But maybe we'll get a little more to that in, like, the final, final thoughts. <laughs> right. Um, but for now, we should probably move on to our pair of black suits that we'll be covering tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so first and foremost, we have, uh... Kenji Yamazaki, 
he presents an idea for one of the death games that gets shot down by Tonegawa in the second episode. And in the third, despite going on a company retreat to rebuild morale, like, he is the one person in the group that just cannot be convinced that Tonegawa is just doing this all for them and and he's skeptical until the last minute when he is given a pretty pretty painful reminder of disloyalty to the Tei Corporation. Let's just no. say that is not a grill for meat. <laughs> you can't explain what that belt is there for. <laughs> That is not for vegetables. Oh, it's to hold your tongs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, next up we have uh, Jiro Simon Saburo. Uh, he really doesn't get much of a role to play until episode four when he actually has an opportunity to shoot down an idea of Tonegawa's to re represent the idea of a game of rock, paper, scissors. And his PowerPoint game is on point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for the sake of expediency, because I didn't expect everybody to make predictions on them, we're, I'm just going to go over who plays them real quick. Kenji Yamazaki is played by Andrew Love, who you would know as Fujimaki from Angel Beats. Mink from Dramatical Murder. Uh, he played Toshizo Hijikata in the Hakuoki franchise. He's Akainu in One Piece. And he's Takeo Goda in My Love Story. Now, Jiro Simon Saburo is an interesting case. He is played by a man named Alan Brinks. As of right now, he doesn't actually have any named roles at Sentai Filmworks. Or really any on IMDb. Which is good, because this it was, was going to be inevitable that with Sentai ramping up their speed of dubbing, they were going to have to call in, you know, they're going to have to open up the casting call to newbies. So this is good. This is a chance to test the new crop over at Sentai. Right. Um, so, Noah, why don't you start yeah. us off? All right. Well, um, the, uh, okay, uh, we're talking about the ones in the, the two who wear the black sunglasses, right? Uh... You gotta be yes. way more specific than that. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, the two and the black sunglasses that also have black suits, right? Yes, I think. <laughs> okay, I, 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 okay, no, do you seriously want me to go over to your house and punch you? Stop. Uh, no, no, that, that's okay. That's right. I can feel you punching me through the internet. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, yeah, Ritz made the comment that um, there's not a whole lot of standoutness as far as the actual uh, characters go. So I was actually listening very closely with my ears to find out if the characters, once addressed by name, actually had like vocal tics or quirks in the way they were directed or spoke that made them stand out for one another. And with these two, there wasn't so much of a difference. Like Andrew Love has a distinct enough voice that I can tell, um, like he, he sounded a little bit different. Um, he's just got like a little more flair, a little more flavor to his voice. But the speaking pattern is very similar to the rest of them. They all have a very uh, Midwestern kind of accent. None of them have, like, crazy accents or dialects. And that's perfectly fine. Um, I guess I should just focus on uh, Andrew's standout scene, which is, like, we were kind of hinting at it before, the part where he's kind of freaking out about remembering what that grill is for. It's not for grilling meat. It's for, it's for burning victims when they grovel at you. It's like, what's the grovel griddle or something like that? The groveling griddle. And trust yeah, me, that, that has some very important significance at the end of the first season of Kaiji. Well, it's kind of showed in the show itself, so which is good, because otherwise I wouldn't have quite known what exactly he was freaking out about. But um, I've got I've got nothing but good things to say about Andrew's uh, role on that. For a role that's supposed to blend in the background and is not really defined by any huge vocal quirk, I have nothing bad to say about it, which is probably the best thing that you can say in the situation. No one, n neither, both of these were not, um, didn't stick out like a sore thumb. Like, I was listening for, like, a misdirection or a flat line or anything like that. And no, it's it's consistent throughout all the episodes that they're in. No stray lines, and 
Uh, I guess that's the best thing I can say about it. Okay. Uh, Jet? <laughs> okay, um, so, yeah, like, uh, Noah was saying, there wasn't, um, I mean, there wasn't, like, too much distinction between these two, aside from, you know, natural speaking patterns. Which, I mean, which I feel definitely works in this case, because the black suits are all supposed to sound the same, so I think, uh, kind of having that silver tone that I'm kind of asking to joke a little bit. I mean, but of course, Andrew Love's voice is distinct enough that I could tell right away it was him, and I enjoyed him. I got, like, I got a few lines out of his antics in episode 3, where he was, you know, acting all skeptical about Tonegawa, and I thought that was pretty funny. And, uh, and especially his reaction to the griddle, because I do very vividly remember that scene in season one, and uh, being able to laugh at that is kind of a weird experience for me, but yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, boy. And, uh, okay, and I'm sorry, what was the other actor's name? My mind blanked. Um, Alan Brinks. <laughs> okay, um, okay, so as for Alan Brinks, um, it is. Uh, it didn't set out to be quite as much, but I. De- uh, but I definitely. En- but I definitely enjoyed his work in episode four, where he got to do the PowerPoint. That's uh, so, um, and, uh, and there's definitely a very. And there's definitely a quality to his voice that sounded very kind of like businessman like, which I guess kind of fits. And I'm. I'm certainly curious to hear what it'll sound like in any other roles he gets in the future. So yeah, uh, good with both of these two. Nice. We're really reaping on the high praise here. <laughs> Amon? Yeah, no, I also enjoyed these two. Um, they, 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 I think, by design, do not stand out that much. All the black suits are very similar by design. But I do like a lot of what um, both of them brought to their roles. Andrew Love is very fun when he's in his, especially in episode three, where he's like, I'm not going to get conned into this. I'm not going to enjoy these steaks and this beer. No, I don't like you. <laughs> and then the griddle shows up and he's like, I know what that is. This is not cool. Oh my God. Uh, uh. And they're like, they're like, uh, at the end, it's like, uh, Yamazaki, have some meat. <laughs> uh. <laughs> And it's just like that's some that's some good power play right there, Tony. <laughs> let let I can say from personal experience that you give a office worker free food and you will have them bought for the rest of your life. Pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, and Andrew Andrew loves really funny, but he's just fl- internally flipping out and like he's just like, does he know what that is? Is that why is this here? Oh my god! I <laughs> okay, Mr. Tony guy, I guess we're gonna do what you want to do now. Works for me, and um, I know I, I also enjoyed Alan Brinks. Um, I like you whenever when I I I not to, not to spoil too much, but this is not the last time that uh, uh, Sami Sosobaru uh, does a, a PowerPoint power play. And, uh, I, mean, I, <laughs> I love I, the way I like, you phrase that PowerPoint power play. You're welcome. I like I like that because he has this he brings this nice kind of like salesman quality to his voice when he's pitching these things. <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, this is why you should open my idea. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying his character, and I think he, he brings a... He, he fits in with kind of the crowd well, but also there's a little bit of distinctness to his character, and I'm looking forward to hearing more of him out of this. And kudos to him for... It, it, since as far as I can tell, I think this is his, like, debut anime voice acting role. Like, kudos to him for doing a very good job, I think. Yeah, as far as I could see, this pretty much is the first thing he's done in terms of anime. Like, he's probably, like radio or stage but mm. yeah yeah okay all right all right all right uh so andrew love as uh kenji yamazaki like i love how just absolutely burned out he is in episode three after after getting chewed out by tonagawa just his whole distrust and and ultimately like being angry at everything like that was that was a really good performance and then when the groveling grill is brought out and he's just freaking out over it because he knows what it's for and nobody else seems to and that that was just absolutely beautiful like a certain character interacting with the petard he will one day be hoisted from 
is it, it was just one of the most beautiful scenes I could have pictured for this show. So it sounds like this has a lot more enjoyment to it if you've seen Kaiji. Yeah, pretty much. But uh, I'll, I'll say more about that in Final Thoughts. This whole thing is reminding me a little bit of, um, like, have you guys ever seen the movie Lion King One and a Half? <laughs> yeah. I did not. I, weirdly, I never got a. I've seen like bits and pieces of that, but I never got around to watching the whole thing. Well, let me just paint it for you, uh, Jet. It's basically the entire Lion King told from the perspective of. Yeah, it's, 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 no, no, like, no, like I know, like I know what the movie is. I just haven't like actually sat down and watched it. But, right, but I'm saying like the, the humor of it is that like they're trying to make light out of all the situations they're in, but there's like really dark undertones if you know what's actually going on, which you only get if you've seen the Lion King. So I'm, I'm getting kind of a similar vibe from the way Kaiji is described here. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, okay, yeah, that basically is. This is the Lion King one and a half of Kaiji, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> the the mid-quill you never knew you wanted. <laughs> and as for Simon Saburo, I really, I really love the fact that he kind of... He gets not only a little bit of a used car salesman vibe, but he also has that, well actually kind of personality to him as he's interjecting Konagawa. It, it's just it's just beautiful. Especially his whole pitch for the um, Restricted Rock, Paper, Scissors game. It sounds like business jargon. And it's just wonderful. All for a silly kids game. Oh no, not for kids. <laughs> no. No. I mean, they're, they're take again. This is kind of a farce of uh, of high end office seriousness. But instead of talking about like corporate mergers and hundred person layoffs, we're talking about making a game for the boss. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll have more on that in final thoughts. But uh, Andrew Love and Alan Brinks, you both did a really good job. Thumbs up. Uh, so next on our list. Originally, I had him as the last character we would be talking about tonight, but it's kind of an odd fit. I mean, where do you put the narrator? It's a good question, especially for, especially for a narrator like this. <laughs> the word of God, the guide to the audience, the narrator. The, the Mike and or Joel and the bots of this show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, did any of you gentlemen have predictions for the narrator? Yes. Noah, why don't you oh, tell us who you predicted for the narrator? Me! Okay. This was a rule of, um, having watched just the first episode, because every time I do one of these podcasts, I watch the first episode in Japanese to get a feel for what the actors could sound like in English. And for this one... Uh, going through the Rolodex of Sentai actors, Ty Mahoney, if you've ever heard of that uh, fine strapping young man, uh, has got a fun quality to his voice that I've heard in stuff like Nozaki-kun, and he's also Jin in Food Wars. He's got like a manry voice to him that's also like fun to listen to. So for like an almost authoritarian narrator who can uh, spice up the shenanigans, for lack of a better word, I wanted uh, Ty to step into the narrator role. Okay, yeah, I could have seen that, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was either that or, like, just throwing darts at a board, honestly, because, like you said, where do you put this guy? Yeah. Um, I'm on Jet. I didn't have any predictions for this one. Yeah, I I didn't either. It's funny, because that should have been, that should have been at least one of the three characters I would have had predictions for, but, yeah. Okay, um, so I honestly wasn't sure who to put in for the narrator as well, but I kind of had general ideas of what I wanted, and because the narrator for Mr. Tonegawa is not the same person who did the narration for Kaiji or even Akagi, uh, completely different person i i kind of wanted someone who could take the you know the high energy tone of mr tonegawa's narrator and then be able to transition that into like the harsh 
loud narrator of Akagi and Kaiji. And for that, I had the idea of Jay Hickman. Okay, I also could have seen that. Uh, mainly for his role in Akamega Kill, and that's actually not the only person I predicted because of Akage... Uh, <laughs> Akage <ga> Kill. <laughs> Akage ga, Akage Kill. The crossover just, nobody demanded and nobody wanted. That, uh, wow, that is a really bloody game of Ma Jung. <laughs> <laughs> and this is coming from part of a franchise where you gamble with your own blood. Ooh. Uh, I'm starting to get a sense of the real political commentary of Kaiji now. Oh, Actually, that was you a Kagi. No, oh, you uh, have no idea. I'm, sur I'm, sur I'm, starting to, I'm starting to get a sense of this writer's political leanings then. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, you have no idea. <laughs> um, But in any case, our narrator is played by none other than David Wall. And you hear that sound? That, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the sound of all of the girls from all over the country just... Eee! That's called a squee. <laughs> I'm not, okay, that was a really terrible squee. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> and I say all the girls, but at, at least like 50% of the guys, too. Like me. I, I, am, I was also squeeing when I heard that David Wald was the narrator. Especially after the Kakarillo the Kakarillo episode. <laughs> Um, so, David Wald, you would know as Bulat from Akamega Kill. Uh, he was Hannes in Attack on Titan, Bergkatsa in Getcherman Crowds, Hio in Uchio and Tora, and because this will be relevant next season, he plays Gajil in Fairy Tale. Um, so, Amon, how did you feel about the narrator? Uh, well, earlier you may have heard me say that I think this is the comedy dub of the year so far. And a lot of that's the rest of the dub. But like 65% of that's just David Wall. Yes. He, is, he, is, he is a delight yes. here. Like, even I feel, even if you... you, you could, I feel like I'll get into my thoughts on how accessible this is as someone who's not really familiar with Kaiji. Kaiji, um... And final thoughts, but I feel like in just terms of raw performance, I feel like you could put someone someone who has no idea what any of these series are or what they're about and play in this dub, and I think David Wall can get them to stick around by himself. He is having it up so hard. It is so <laughs> wonderful. He is just... I, I couldn't even tell it was David Wald at first. I was like, that was David Wald? Who plays, who plays like the upsetting doctor in Shiki? That David Wald? Wow, <laughs> he is. I, I think I think it was in the first episode where he, I forget what exactly it is, but he gives some ludicrous pronunciation to the name of the fancy cruise ship they're on. The S. And it was like, yep, there we go, Espoir. And I'm like, uh, I'm pretty sure that's how to narrate in Japanese, but that's it too. <laughs> it's hard not to. It's just right there. Um. <laughs> But he's, he's just so entertaining consistently throughout this thing. He he's so I always forget he's not an actual character in the show. Like <laughs> there's no there's no real person that corresponds to the narrator. He's just the voice of God commenting on these idiots as they try and muddle together through their job. He's he's just beautiful. Yeah, this show it's joins so that, that tiny pantheon of shows like um, Oh Kamisan or Sergeant Frog, where the best character is the narrator. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy him a lot. I think he is very good. Okay. Um, Jet? Okay. Um, okay, uh, so like what Ruth was saying with this, uh, I mean, well, no, actually, I'll start off with the performance first. Uh, so, you know, like, so I was uh, very impressed with this. Uh, David Wald was, not, was certainly not who I was anticipating for this role, but he was clearly having a lot of fun with it. Like, I'm, like, I mean, I don't like to, you know, try to guess this stuff too much, but I am almost 100% certain he would just specifically told to do whatever he wanted. Because it really... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. definitely does not feel like a wrong answer. <laughs> no, I, because, get, uh, I get the full impression that Kyle just uh, tossed him in the booth and said, look, I know what you can do. We, we've gone drinking together. Just do your thing, man. Have fun. <laughs> Yeah, because he uh, because he's just all over the place here. He's and he's really having fun with it. Like you get a bunch of 
you know, from all the crazy pronunciation to him doing a couple of crazy accents from time to time. He's just really, he's just really having a lot of fun behind this booth, and and it's honestly not hard. It's honestly hard to not have fun listening to him. It's just, it's a real delight. And um, also, like what Ruth was kind of saying a little bit earlier, and while I was getting a lot of blasts out of this, I, as someone who is familiar with Kaji, I was also thinking, okay, this is good, but how would this sound if he was to be the narrator in Kaji proper? And, of course, I am pretty familiar with David Wald's voice, and I know that while he can obviously be pretty silly as he's doing here, uh, he can also be more serious when he needs to be, and while the narrator in Kaiji isn't, like, you know, stone cold serious, and that also gets pretty silly from time to time, but I feel, but I feel like David Wald would be able to handle that pretty well, so if an actual Kaiji dub gets made, I hope he comes back. And, uh, yeah, this was uh, definitely the stand-up performance of this dub. And uh, probably one of my front runners for like best comedy role of the year because he just really have a fun with it. Good stuff. Nice. Uh, Noah. Um, I put down in uh, with my writing on the paper in front of me. I wrote in big block letters, having way too much fun. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I know that dubbing is hard, and that any kind of acting is difficult. I am not convinced that anyone should be having this much fun and getting paid for it at the same time. <laughs> That's almost criminal! It really is, it's like, I, I, I would die to be in this man's position. But that, I, I would need his talent too, because as you pointed out, uh, Jet, he goes through a ton of impressions throughout the whole show, and it's not like he's... What's weird is that we're describing it as he's joking and commentating with these wild, outrageous accents. And you would think that he's, like, mocking the material, but he's really not. He's just over-exaggerating everything that's going on. But it, it reaches, it matches with the melodramatic tone that they're going for in the show. Because in the show, the tiniest things are amplified to be world-shattering. Like, the character of the, uh, the, the president... Falling asleep during a screening of a movie is, like, life-threatening. Like, if I wake him up, he'll be mad at me. But if I let him miss the finale, I'll be screwed! There's no way out of this! And it's a simple <laughs> solution. Like, just pause the movie, guys. No, no, this is life or death. So, having the narrator match that corniness makes this a lot more fun. You know, it takes mundane office politics and turns it into something that is much more enjoyable to listen to. I, I really would be curious, like, is this something that would be, would uh, lend itself to a rewatch? Because some of the best shows that I've experienced are ones that you can rewatch and are, you know, they stand up to a, watching it more than once. I would imagine that David's over the top performance would make this something I would actually want to watch again in like a year or two from now. So. Yeah, I, I was trying to also pick out, like, something wrong with this. Like, can I critique David's performance at all? Can I pick up this apart? Maybe the writing's off. Maybe it's, like, tone dissonant. And I, I can't. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, get me a David Wald t-shirt. I'm in the fan club now. <laughs> get me a Mahjong t-shirt. <laughs> all right. So David Wald as the narrator is, is just absolutely pitch perfect beautiful like from from the sort of almost sportscaster tone he takes in the first episode to pulling off impressions of such people as Robin Leach Jacques Cousteau Julia Child like without missing a beat is just wonderful I what was the Julia Child where was the Julia Child voice um, I believe it was while they were cooking the, uh, while they were grilling the meat. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, you're right. I, oh, that was a British accent in there. But, um, all, just going from manic performance to manic performance to manic performance without skipping beats, just matching the over-the-top nature of just what's going on on the screen it's it's wonderful and the only thing i could critique in terms of the performances some of the jokes that really worked in the japanese version didn't quite get pulled off so well in in english mainly because of the ridiculousness of just you know someone 
someone, a native speaker of Japanese randomly pulling out words in English. And that's really hard to emulate, and considering that David Wald is able to basically ping-pong between, like, an absolutely balls-to-the-wall, screaming his lungs out, uh, narration to just randomly pulling out impressions, like, that is definitely a fair trade. And as I said before, this... I would totally be okay with David Wald continuing as the narrator for Kaiji, possibly even Akagi down the road if Sentai was that bold. David Wald, good God. <laughs> Give this man a dubby. Uh, so moving on, we have the president of the Tei Corporation, Kazutaka Hiyoto. Uh, sort of an eccentric old man who revels in the misery of others below him. Which is not unlike most old men, to be honest. Uh, touche. Reveling in the misery of others. <clears throat> I, it, it's gonna come for you. All, all you men listening out there, once you get old and grouchy and, you know, you are you just gotta get, you gotta take uh, enjoyment in the misery of others. My kid is out there watching Up right now. That, that right there, that geriatric personality, that's gonna be you one day. Wait, I get to turn to Ed Asner when I turn old? Huzzah! Yes! <laughs> you know what? That that sounds like a good trade-up, doesn't it, Amon? I want to really fly does. to South America with a house <laughs> strung up by balloons. Yeah. Yep, yep, and you'll get your own talking dog and your own Asian kid, and yeah, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I want to be a Batman villain. <laughs> uh, but anyway um, Oh sorry, way off topic <laughs> Yeah Kyoto has set Tonegawa on a quest to develop a death game That puts the, the lives of debtors at stake for financial freedom For his own amusement That right there should tell you that this guy Probably a pleasant conversationalist if you think about it uh, but in any case, um, Noah, did you have a prediction for Hyoto? Why do you keep coming back to me? What, what makes you think I made a prediction? Just spill the beans. Okay, okay, <laughs> fine, you're fine, you got me. Okay, um, so this is one where, um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a line into the microphone, and I want you all to follow with me here, and figure out if you can guess who I predicted. <clears throat> all right. All you young children who love stories, come gather round. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, there was a show back in the ADV dubbed a long time ago called Princess Tutu, and the main bad guy of that one was a creepy old guy named Drosselmeyer, who reminded me a whole lot of this character. And so, and I was like, okay, that was dubbed a long time ago. I don't know if this guy is still you know, working in the Houston area as an actor or not, but heck, I'm just gonna write it down because I already used my other old man prediction for the lead character. So I put Marty Fleck down as my guess for Yoda. Okay. I kind of had a similar track to you. I also predicted Marty Fleck, but my yeah. reasoning was a little bit different. I had watched a comic get killed during its run during Toonami. And there is a character the advisor to the Emperor, his name is Honest. The character is anything but. Hmm. Go for a bit of a irony there, huh? He's just this crazy old man who who revels in the in death and destruction, and I thought that was perfect. To the point where he was even my prediction for Hyoto. In the event Funimation acquired Kaiji or Mr. Tonegawa. Okay. Do, do a little bit of commuting, huh? And, um, in this case, everybody who made predictions was right! <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> yes! That never yes. happens! <laughs> that honestly doesn't! Unless it's like a super obvious thing, yeah, that doesn't usually happen. So, Kazutake Hyoto is played by Marty Fleck, who you would know as Honest from A Comic Get Killed. Drosselmeyer and Princess Tutu. Uh, <laughs> Kaikino Shin Oizumi in Food Wars the Second Plate. 
And more recently, you could hear him as Bookaboo in the animated film Yona Yona Penguin. All right, so... Which, which I have still to watch because I don't think it's actually come out, has it? Um, I uh, think it's up on High Dive now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's on High Dive. Oh, okay. I think the Blu-ray may have come out already, although I'm not sure. I mean, I know it was really recent. I didn't know if it was up for streaming or not yet. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I saw it up on streaming like the other day, so it, it's there. I'll add it to the two watch list then. Okay, so Noah, what did you think about Hyoto? Oh, how I've missed Marty in performances. Um, I didn't watch Akame Got Kill, and I hadn't gotten around to watching the dub of uh, Season 2 of Food Wars yet, so I have not heard Marty in anything in a very long time. And he's such glorious Texas, Texas ham that I'm so glad they put him on this. He's got this um, slower drawl to his speaking voice that is supposed to match a, an older gentleman. You know, he's a grandpa character. Uh, but it's also like he's got this sinister wickedness to him that I absolutely love listening to. It, it, it takes a character that is absolutely unlikable. Like, you wouldn't want to be friends with this guy. And, and makes him fun to listen to. Like, just... What, listening to the gears in his head turn as he's contemplating about the, uh, uh, it's all the same. Like, retweet, subscribe, unsubscribe. There's no excitement in life anymore. And that's the mentality that uh, Marty carries throughout this whole thing in the many episodes that he's in. It doesn't even need the visual image of him lying down on top of his subordinates to, to like, <laughs> emphasize how, un like, how unpleasant of a boss he must be. And, the, I mean, you know, this is a show where, yeah, it's all kind of a farce of office politics, and the, a show like this is going to make the boss just seem like the most irredeemable, unlikable guy. You know, it's like Tone in uh, a Gretzko, where, you know, if you're the boss in a Japanese show about the office, you are, you're just not going to be painted well. I can't think of one sh anime that took place in an office that had the, the boss looking good. You're either sadistic but, you or you're incompetent. Exa yes, yes, you're sadistic like this, or you're incompetent like in Legend of Black Heaven, or something like that. So, to, to make up for all that, though, Marty's perfectly spot on in this in slower, drawled voice that it has this nice growl to it, and I could not think of anyone better to have voiced this. Like, mm, is a good show. All right, um, Jet? Okay, um, so once again, I was first, I was uh, approaching this from the perspective of someone who has watched Kaiji. And uh, if you've watched Kaiji, you would know this guy is very bad news because, I mean, well, I, well, in very, I guess, minor spoilers because it's kind of made apparent pretty, it's kind of made apparent pretty early, but uh, this guy is the villain, like the main villain of Kaiji. So, <laughs> what are you talking about? He did, he did nothing shock. wrong. <laughs> Kuma shock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, and uh, the and uh, for an old man, he does some very, very bad things in Kaiji proper. So, uh, seeing him in a, so seeing him played for laughs is uh, kind of surreal to me. Uh, but uh, but he does definitely have an over. And it was a top enough quality that I could see you playing it for lots a little bit. And, um, yeah, and I think he generally works here in that respect. And as for Marty Fleck's performance, uh, he definitely sounds very... Uh, he definitely sounds very fitting. And he... And, uh, while he wasn't the first person who came to mind for me, if I had actually put down predictions, he's definitely a very good fit. Uh, he, ha he has a very nice... He has a very, like, naturally sinister quality to his voice. And I've enjoyed him in the, like the other villain roles I've heard him play before because like he, he just has that he just he just sounds like very I don't it's weird to say someone sounds very naturally evil, but it's just you hear his voice and you just automatically think, okay, this person is bad news. And uh and it's very appropriate because if you look at Hyodo, he automatically looks like bad news. I mean, seriously, nothing about nothing about his design screams trust for me. And, uh, that's, and, yeah, uh, Marty Fleck was definitely having a lot of fun with it. Um, uh, you know, getting across that whole poor old man routine while also having a very kind of dark quality beneath the surface. Uh, but, like, but of course, again, I'm a person who is one of the of someone who has watched Kaiji, so I was thinking, how would he sound in Kaiji proper? And, uh, he definitely sounds evil enough that he would probably be pretty good at that, so I hope he comes back. And I guess I've done rambling, my bad. 
<laughs> okay. Um, Amon? Yeah, no, I, I'm... I'm also really enjoying Marty uh, playing this character, uh, who is awful. Just just the absolute worst human being, boy. He did nothing wrong. He's just out collecting the money he's owed, you know? He did nothing wrong. He's the air capitalist. He's everything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned these writers' politics at the start of the show, because a lot of things about this series are starting to, like, oh, 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 wow. Like I said, I it's, a, it, it's a farce, which um, I, I'm sure if there were, like, a less intelligent viewers would think that the show was advocating for what these people do and not condemning them. <laughs> some, some poor saps out there watching, it's like, yeah, yeah, this is the right idea. <laughs> <laughs> wait, the the wait same poor souls who watched Fight Club and said, oh, yeah, that's what I want to be like. <laughs> Tyler um, Durden, now that's a role model. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But uh, yeah, Marty, Marty's having a lot of fun here, and I enjoy that. Um, I'm not familiar with everything he's done in the past, but clearly playing evil old men is a specialty of his. He's clearly got the <laughs> chops for it. It's been it's been a hot minute since I've seen any of Princess Tutu, but I don't recall Drosselmeyer being a very nice man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, he he's <laughs> yeah. No, he's just he's just delightful here. He hits that right point of keeping he keeps the character like loathsome but you can also laugh at what a ridiculous like caricature of a human being he is what with his constant napping <laughs> and just general ill temperament at the world <laughs> it's like all right he might be in a good mood but only when he comes out of his bath <laughs> only when the eyebrows are below 40 degrees <laughs> exactly um, it, 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 the show already hits that tone very well, and I think Marty Fleck really about, uh, sits on that line uh, really well, too, of just being funny, but, like, there, you can always tell, like, yeah, this, this guy's bad news. Probably shouldn't be dissociating with him. <laughs> Yeah. You may you may have back you may have backed the wrong horse, Tony Gal. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> I mean, this might this might end badly for you. I mean, uh, Tony Go isn't really a saint either, but we'll get to that eventually. I know, I know, but I, I, I know <laughs> that he's that out. He, he's he's better than at least. <laughs> he's not so terrible. But, you know, I'm 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 enjoying Marty Fleck immensely, and I look forward to more episodes of him being just. Just hilariously terrible to everyone around him. Nice. Uh, so, Kazutaka Hiyoto is a very, very effective villain in Kaiji. I mean, for crying out loud, the man made a tissue box a matter of life and death. I am really glad that Marty Fleck just gets this... Just the evil venture capitalist down so well because he like watching other people in misery is the only thing that makes Hiyoto happy in the in the twilight years of his life and him just inflicting misery on everybody around him including Tonegawa and including the black suits like it's it's just fun to watch, even though it would definitely not be fun to be around him. And Marty Fleck gets this really, really well and and hits a performance that I, as somebody who's wanted Kaiji dubbed for the better part of eight or nine years, like, this is... This is great. This is exactly what I pictured I wanted out of the character. And not to mention that, in this case, this villain is flung into a gag comedy where he's played for laughs. And it's just this surreal experience watching a guy who you know is capable of some heinous, heinous stuff just be the butt of a joke it is it it's a very funny performance with an air of menace to the back of it that i am absolutely confident if sentai filmworks turns around and dubs kaiji that marty fleck would be able to get sort of the the more sinister 
Kyoto down to a T. So, Marty Fleck, pitch perfect. Beautiful. That, that's all this podcast really is, isn't it? It's, it's not about Mr. Tonegawa's show at all. This is an open letter to Sentai Filmworks advocating, please license and dub Kaiji, isn't it? Maybe. Just just a just a two hour <laughs> two hour on our hands and knees pleading on the groveling griddle. Please, please dub this thing. Okay, I don't know if I'd get on the griddle for that, but <laughs> <laughs> Like I wouldn't put my head on the wouldn't put the head my head on the metal, but I'd be <laughs> And you'd grovel on the griddle. A fan. <laughs> I'd well, feel the heat. And speaking of someone who has will inevitably feel the heat, uh, we have one more character to talk about. That we do. None other than the titular Mr. Tonegawa. Uh, Yukio Tonegawa is second in command to Hyoto. He has been given the task of developing a death game. The aforementioned game in which debtors clear their debt by risking their lives. He likes to think he's a good boss. But in reality, he just bullies his subordinates around. We could, we could debate that a little bit. I mean, he calls them gutter balls for corn's sake. He does. Like, there's a uh, there's a farcical mentality about uh, being the middle management on this whole thing. It's, it's someone who thinks very long and hard about how to get uh, results. Like, he's not in this exactly to make friends, but he realizes that he does need to have at least some good repertoire with his subordinates if he wants to get anything done. I mean, how, why else would you spend all that money on the vacation and the meat and the booze for yeah, these guys? like, okay, let, let's, let's talk about that for a second. He pulls bottles of wine from his private collection. Uh, those, since they're from his collection, I can't necessarily put any value on that. But he pulls out Wagyu beef. What? You, the best cow flesh you can get in Japan. Like, specifically names it as Kobe beef. But, like, I can't... I couldn't get a... Um, I couldn't get a price on actual Kobe beef online doing some research, but I was able to look up Wagyu beef. It runs for about $1,200 a pound. And considering there are I want to say at least 12 to 18 black suits, like, that is that is a lot of money he blew on that on that, that beef. Quite, that, like, that that's... I, I can't even fathom that. Like, I'm just thinking about, like, what my own food budget is, and I'm like, okay, I spent, like, you know, it's like four ninety nine per pound for 80-20 beef, and then you go around and tell me it's that much for a pound of this beef? And bear in mind, this is 2018 dollars. Like, Mr. Tonegawa <laughs> presumably takes place early 90s. Oh, you're right. Oh. I forget. Actually, uh, even earlier than that, too, because we see, like, a Jazzercise video at one point, don't we? Yeah. Like, so, I, like I, I would estimate it like late 80s, early 90s. Because this, yeah, this also falls around the time of uh, Japan's recession. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd, yeah, I'd say it's not, too, it's not too far before Kaiji proper, maybe like four or five years before. Okay. And yeah, that's like mid to late 90s. So. But um, in any case, back to Tonegawa. Um, he's basically in the first four episodes of the series trying to build up the morality of his men in order to get ideas for a death game. Uh, so Noah, did you have predictions for Yukio Tonegawa? Absolutely. And, uh, like I kind of alluded to before, I had already used my go-to old man voice from Sentai dubbing, um, on, um, this particular role... And that was the illustrious John Swayze. Oh. I don't know if I have to uh, introduce uh, any of his roles before, but he, he is, to me, the best-known old guy voice from the Houston area, and I honestly I don't know who else I could have picked. Like, it was John and Marty are, like, the go-to guys in that area I know of. I don't know if I know any other ones that I could have even put here. But he's also a great actor. Like, just 
really good actor as well. Yeah. Um, I had thought about John Swayze as Tonagawa for a little while, but my, my actual prediction ended up being the same guy I use for Funimations, and that ended up being David Wall. Ah. Okay. I kind of see that, honestly. Hmm. Because he's he just has that gravelly tone to his voice that I I thought would have went well to uh, to Tonagawa. Did you have like a particular role in mind that uh, you thought would have uh, sounded similar to this? Uh, yeah, his role from Shiki. Oh, oh, the doctor. Yeah, I I can't yeah, remember okay. his name unfortunately, but Ozaki. Okay. Um, but. Neither Noah or I were correct in this. Um, playing, no. <laughs> uh, playing Yukio Tonegawa is a man by the name of David Harbol. Uh, he's relatively new to Sentai Filmworks. Yeah. Um, other than Tonegawa and a role I can't actually mention because it hasn't actually come out yet. Like there's there's no real use talking about a, a role that. Hasn't been released yet, so the only other thing to his name right now on ANN is Masakazu Takemoto in Devil's Line. Uh, Amon, what did you think of Yukio Tonegawa? Uh, I I enjoyed David's performance a lot. Uh, he, he just has a really good quality to his voice as far as... He sells Tonegana kind of on, like... Tonaga was interesting because he's, as we, I think we mentioned earlier, he's not like the best dude, but you kind of feel for him just because he is a middle manager. And that means he has to wrangle and play nice with his subordinates, but he's also not the top boss and he has to grovel to some other dude on the other end. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought I thought David just, he did his wonderful, I mean, part of it's, um, he, he nails that aspect of the character as somebody who, like, is honestly trying his best to do a good job, even when his job is like, Hey, I'm bored. Make up a game to make debtors suffer for my amusement. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then they, you know, he gets all his, he gets all his people together. He has a meeting, and the entire first meeting is a complete waste because he does not know who any of these people are, and he cannot tell any of them apart. And we're going to and stretch this joke out for an entire length of the episode. I enjoyed that whole episode. Thank you. I think, I think David's he's very good at selling that sort of like casual frustration of like this shouldn't be this hard but it is this hard and i and i have no real i like I, I can't do anything about that it's just difficult and frustrating and here i am trying to wrangle with these people and get shit done oh well uh they, I, he he does he does a good job of having that like professional office worker quality but also is able to nail the like silly farce elements of this show where he can't tell who anybody is, or I'm going to bring out this giant griddle. And it's like, hey, what's with this weird cross thing hanging out at the end? Oh, that's so you can hang your tongs up while you're cooking. <laughs> I just, and so, I just so casually, like, it's like, does he, does he know what this is? He must know what this is, but he's, he doesn't sound like he knows what this is. He's, just, he's, 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 he's a lot of fun, and given that, like, obviously the show is about Tanagawa. Uh, he just does a wonderful job of balancing all those aspects of the character of being like serious but also doofy. I, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. Okay, uh, Jet. I'll start off with David's performance. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, he manages to switch between you know the whole like ultra business like Persona and Tonegawa, and like and a lot of and a lot of the goofier aspects. He has to nail down for the comedy. Um. Uh, sorry, uh, it, I mean, it's a little weird for me as someone who's watched Skyji proper, but um, as a, uh, but it worked pretty well in that respect. Uh, but as someone who has watched Skyji proper, I gotta say that um, okay, that out of, out of everything in this show, this is like the weirdest bit of total dissonance for me as someone who has watched the actual Kaiji. Uh, because Sonegawa in Kaiji proper is uh, not a very nice man. Like he's not, he's not as evil as Hyodo, but uh, he's a he's uh, definitely not a nice man. He uh, does some pretty horrible things to people on a regular basis. Uh, so um, so uh, seeing him being played for last is a little weird for me because I mean at least in Hyodo's case Hyodo was kind of over the top to begin with, so that kind of makes sense to me. 
Uh, but uh, playing Tonagawa for a while is just kind of fun little odd, but I mean it. I mean it worked as well as it could. Uh, okay, but uh, so, uh, but again, uh, but again, like with Yodo, I was when I was listening to David's performance, I was thinking, could he play Tonegawa in Kaiji proper? And I think he could, uh, because the thing about Tonegawa in Kaiji proper that this that this show does get off a little bit here, but not quite as much, is that he like is that he that he's very much the kind of super cynical, nihilistic businessman who kind of exists in corporate culture. Like, he, he, like he doesn't, he's just like, okay, this is the way society is, there isn't really much you can do about it, so you just kind of have to, so you either work within society's rules, or you get tossed to the wayside, and that's kind of his whole mentality. And you do see bits of that, and you do see bits of that in this show, but it's, uh, but it's mostly played for laughs, and I can't that more than anything. Uh, but he, uh, but that attitude is prevalent here, and... During those moments where we do see that atti- where we do see that attitude, David manages to play that off pretty well, and uh, and I certainly think that if a natural Kaiji dub does happen, he could probably pull it off. So I hope he comes back. Okay, um, Noah. Well, um, the character himself, um, going through these episodes here, because again, I've never seen Kaiji, so I don't know what his um like his evil deeds are were in that show, but this one. Um, you guys are familiar with the Loop in the Third franchise, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, this uh, character reminded me most of um, the the doofier renditions of Zenigata that we've seen. Um, the very um, archetypal Japanese hard worker who has no room for um, uh, for mistakes. And um, it's not supposed to be villainized so much. I got that from Tonegawa's uh, performance of, look, Japan gets results like we have the expectation that you will get the results done um we do not care about n- about being nice all the time and sometimes that means that in order to get the results though you do have to you have to you know play mind games a little bit so watching the inner workings of him uh struggling with i can't remember all their names they all look the same you gutter balls all look the same or trying to uh get or um we need to think of the right game to play while the president is right there in the room and he's not responding to any of these so they must all be wrong i'm just gonna erase all these off of the board these must all be wrong i can't lose if i don't pick anything so that's that's, i I get why the comedy on that works for a lot of people like i said before it's taking something mundane and seemingly uh innocuous and just stretching out to an extreme level that that's what the best uh, silly Japanese comedy seem to do, at least in the anime world. So as for David's actual performance on this, it's actually a lot less gruff than I had expected. I, I want, I expected with the character design and the role of um, middle-aged uh, senior member of a company to have a lot more uh, gruff and bite to his voice, and it's really not. It, it sounds a lot younger to me than someone who should be that old. Especially because he smokes. Like, the show makes a big emphasis on him smoking. And I don't get that that rasp voice that you usually get with smoking characters. Um, I, I guess they decided just not to put that in the tub itself. Like, they didn't decide to go for, I, uh, I, we're going to have a, a um, meeting today kind of um, voice. I mean, I don't recall him sounding super, super raspy in Japanese either, so it might just be paying homage to that, but it's been a while since I watched Kaiji. Well, I mean, just from the one episode I saw in Japanese, you're right. There wasn't that smoker's rasp in there either. So, um, but I'm just going off of what I expected from this. But I guess uh, in terms of the actual performance... Um, it's okay, it's good. It's serviceable and it's perfectly in line for what the Japanese had and what uh, was supposed to be performed on this. In translating the archetype of a Japanese senior office employee over to an English rendition, you really had two options. They could either make it um, super hammy in a point that it's basically mocking the material, or they could have them play it more straight as a serious person. And they went more with that route. They went with a more serious rendition in David's acting. They gave him kind of a didactic speaking pattern where he like has a heavy emphasis on all of his syllables. And that's per- that's perfectly fine with this. It's um, It probably just doesn't help that both um, uh, the president and the narrator get all of the best comedy moments. So Tonegawa was not really supposed to have 
the comedy parts, but we are supposed to laugh at his overemphasizing and overreacting to everything, which David does well. Like, he doesn't, like, one good thing I can say is that he doesn't go so over the top as to make fun of the source material, which would have been detrimental to the overall performance. And that's really what surprised me the most about this dub is just with how silly it is, how melodramatic it all is, none of the actors, and especially David's Tonegawa, does not go so over the top as to make fun of it at any point. And that, that I think, is worth a, a respectable golf clap. All right, uh, yeah, my thoughts on Tonegawa. Um, I have to say, I was kind of surprised doing research for this show that um, David Harbold has as few roles on ANN as I saw, because he sounds like somebody who may have been around the ADV screwball comedy. Like, his voice sounds like it fit in that era. And it really, it really helped tie the dub of Mr. Tonegawa together. Like, it's, it's not the best performance in the show, and by no means did it have to be. But I, I really appreciate that he's able to sort of not only take the, the stern side of Tonegawa for a spin, but also sort of the ridiculous over-the-top Zawazawa moments, which, you know, in the case of Kaiji, that's like, am I going to die here, right here and now? And in Mr. Tonegawa's case, it's, oh god, I can't remember any of the employees' names. What do I do? It's weird that this is the first dubbed entry of the franchise, but I, I really do like... David Harbold's performance as Yukio Tonegawa. It skirts that line really well between the the serious side and the comedic side. So, really good. David Harbold, like, welcome to Sentai Filmworks. You get a thumbs up from me. Uh, so, with that said, I believe it's time we moved on to final thoughts. So, Noah, why don't you start us off? Certainly, we're we're in the final frame here. Let's let's get, let's do this. Let's do this. Roll a so strike. This is, right, let's let's. Oh, which by the way, um, I don't know if this is going up before or after this episode comes out, but um, uh, uh, Jet and I uh found out that we're both equally good at bowling uh, when we went to uh, A Fest. So I, I'm glad that we both get to be on a show where bowling is kind of like a recurring theme throughout all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we we yeah. So, anyways, this show itself. Um, I gotta be honest. Um. I love Madhouse, and I love me some Sentai Filmworks, but um, this is just kind of the kind of show that I, I get the feeling that it's a lot funnier to people who have either seen Kaiji and therefore kind of have a, a better understanding of the franchise going into it, or are or like more steeped in uh, Japanese business culture to the point, not so much steeped in, but I mean like uh, get it so that they can get some humor out of the farce of this whole thing. But, um, but that's just the show itself, like, my own thoughts on the show. Like, this is one of those shows where I was watching it, and I was saying, I'm, I'm enjoying this, but I feel like I'm trying to force myself to like it more than I actually am, which is never a great sign. So, th just for me personally, it w this isn't going to be, like, my favorite show of the season or anything like that. Certainly a great comedy on the parts with uh, David and Marty, but it's just, like, you know, it's an okay show. But the dub, I gotta say, the dub, really good does not mock the material, as I've said 30 times throughout this podcast, is really, um, really good at translating what may be difficult to translate Japanese, um, tastes into an, uh, into a script and acting that is comparable to English speakers, and, uh, is honestly reeled in a lot more than I thought it was going to be for a comedy like this. Like, these are what some of the best comedies do. Good com- like, bad comedies, I should say, are just silly and over the top without a punchline, good comedies know when to reel it in so that the silly moments feel funnier in comparison to the flat moments. So for that, I'd say this is a great dub that is, honestly, I'm really surprised it's coming out on a once a week basis. It's really well done, especially for Sentai's um, uh, relatively new dubcast program. 
and I do plan on keeping up with the whole thing. Um, maybe not so much of the story portion of it, because I'm not so wrapped up in the continuous story of we what are we going to do to keep the president happy storyline to it. But, you know, it's something pleasant enough to watch on a week-to-week -week basis. Probably not good for marathoning, though. But dub-wise, pretty good. Okay. Uh, Jet? Okay, um, so, uh, so, like I said way at the beginning of this episode, uh, this was mostly, like, an okay experience to me. Um, I mean, again, I'm pretty familiar with Kaiji proper, so, um, I'm like, and, uh, well, Kaiji certainly can be... And while comedy can, certainly can be pretty funny and how over the top it is, uh, this is a very different brand of comedy than that, so it was a little bit off-putting for me. I mean, but uh, it, but I mostly had a pretty decent time with this, and the dub was certainly the dub certainly played a big part in that. As I uh, there were a lot of really fun performances in here, like with David Wald and Marty Fleck. As I, uh, script, as I uh, the script was also pretty good. It managed it. I was like, I managed to have enough fun with it that it w that it didn't sound wooden or anything, but not so over the top that it felt like it would have any major deviations. And let's say, and uh, let's say, and uh, as someone who isn't as familiar with like the a the early uh, 2000s ADV screwball comedy dubs, uh, this gave me a pretty good idea of what that sounded like. So, uh, yeah, like, so, like, so I'm definitely gonna definitely have to give this show props for that. And, um, and, uh, yeah, this was a pretty solid dub, and I really, really hope, I really, really hope our main three get to come back for Kaiji proper, like, Sentai, for the love of God, but Kaiji. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, Main takeaway you should get from this episode is dub Kaiji. Anybody, somebody. I, I don't know, I think we're, we're being a little too subtle about that. I don't think they quite got the message. Boy, 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 boy. <laughs> uh, does anyone know Morse code? <laughs> <laughs> Just get the hip hop air horn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I'm on. Uh, I really enjoyed this show, and I really enjoyed this dub a lot. Um, I think it helps that this feels like the kind of comedy I I intend to enjoy. It's it's very much like the uh, like the complete absurdity of what is often very like supposed to be normal boring life, but instead you just you find some situation. Where it's like I can't talk to any of my subordinates because I don't know who any of them are. <laughs> they all dress the shame and they all like bowling. Um, so I, 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 even before the dub, I think I, I found I, I think the show was very funny, and I think that dub does a wonderful job of drawing on what makes it so funny, the sort of underlying absurdity of it all, and a lot of the and a lot of the performances help highlight that too. I think this is a very strong dub from like the characters who are supposed to be like kind of interchangeable cogs up to Tanagawa and people on his level. Um, I also want to give the show credit as somebody who knows absolutely nothing about Kaiji. Aside from just, like, it's vaguely about gambling, I thought this did a good job of giving you enough about what Kaiji's deal is that you can follow this as a complete neophyte. Um, like, and, and happily, I know enough now that I want to go watch Kaiji, but I feel like I don't know everything that's going to go in, that's going to happen there going into it. Like, I can watch this and watch Kaiji later and still have a fun, surprising experience in terms of, like, how things turn out. Mm -hmm. Um, so this, just in this and that, so like, kudos to the show for that, because, like, I appreciate that. I want to go watch Kaiji now. Uh, and I, I, I kind of hope this show does well for Sentai, because that will probably help convince them that it's like, you know, there might be money in a Kaiji dub. Maybe we should, uh, maybe we should look into that. Yeah. Get some more, get yeah. some, get some more, get some more game, strange gambling habits yeah. on our channel. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, one thing that, um, I, I mean, I guess this is probably as good a time to mention it as any. Uh, there was one actor in particular who showed up in episode one who was not mentioned, at, who was not credited for some reason, and that was who played Kaiji for like the 15 seconds he showed up in the early part of episode one. So I'm not saying that means anything, but hopefully. <laughs> wink, think, wink. Think, 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 think Sentai might have put something in their back pocket just in case. Also, weirdly enough, I uh, I was doing research and there was another black suit I was planning on talking about, but his character is suspiciously not credited either. 
who play mm. who plays a significant role in the early part of season one and then at the end of season two. So, hmm. This is all very intriguing. To be continued, perhaps? Dot, 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 question mark, hashtag, at sign? Jojo Arrow. <laughs> uh, so I guess it's my turn now, huh? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Coming into this as basically the Kaiji stan of Dub Talk. I, I'm, I'm so glad that became, uh, like, a common phrase this year. Like, <laughs> it's so applicable. I I really enjoyed this dub. I appreciate that the show gives you just enough information to follow it, while not completely ruining uh, the main series of Kaiji for anybody who's interested in watching that. I would advise watching Kaiji before Mr. Tonegawa, though. At the very least, the first season. Yeah, absolutely. Just because, Ugh. like, some of the notes that Mr. Tonegawa hits resonate so much better when you have, like, the knowledge of the groveling grill <laughs> or restricted rock, paper, scissors. You know who Endo is. You know... Like, you see that, you hear that five seconds of Kaiji talking in episode one, and you just uncontrollably get giddy, because you recognize the person who's playing him. Like, that's, that's the kind of thing that, like, a little bit of experience with Kaiji can, can bring into this. But, if you really wanted to watch it blind, like, it helps you along the way and like that that's good but in terms of the dub like solid performances all around even the folks that i didn't mention today because they didn't get a big enough part in the big picture for what we watched as the requirement for doing this episode today all of the people who recur from kaiji gave spectacular performances that I really want to hear continue when the end after the end credits roll on episode 24 of Mr. Tonegawa. Like I I really want to see this dub continue beyond that. And hopefully Sentai Filmworks is able to acquire the license or you know somebody in the general section 23 family. Like Maiden Japan or or like Kraken, someone like that. But just somebody dub Kaiji. Please. Oh. Just do it. Dear Sentai Filmworks. Uh, dear Santa Claus. Roots has been a dear good boy this Sentai year. Dear Sentai Claus. <laughs> Please give this boy a nice present, and that will make him very happy. Dub Kaiji, friends. Signed Roots. Signed, the, but... signed everyone in this cast. <laughs> But, Even though I haven't seen the show at all. I, I have I have the distinct feeling you would enjoy it. You're pro now, my question is, how long is Kaiji? Is it just like a two core series or what? Um, there are two, okay, there are two twenty there are two twenty six episode seasons, so it's about fifty two episodes. Gotcha. But um, you could probably watch season one. You'd know what was going on in Mister Tonegawa, and then you could yeah. grab season two There's a little a, later. It, that's it. Yeah, the, yeah. The one nice thing I can say about Kaiji proper is that it has enough tension that it breathes by very quickly, so you can like breathe through it pretty easily. <laughs> and not to mention, there was like three or four years between seasons one and two, so there is a clean break if you need to take a break. But they were both uh, produced by Madhouse, right? Yeah, yes. both seasons are Madhouse. Gotcha. All right. So, kudos to Sentai. Kudos to Kyle Jones. Kudos to the actors. Bravo. You all like, get fancy steak. <laughs> you all get fancy steaks and lobster and champagne. But I can't actually afford any of that, so here's this <laughs> can of Vienna sausages. So, um, uh, for those of us who are living on Spam, where can we watch this show? Uh, so, you can find Mr. Tonegawa Middle Management Blues, subtitled on Crunchyroll... 
on a week-to-week -week schedule. I believe it's Mondays or Tuesdays that it airs in Japan. Like, that's like six bucks a month. You know, free trial. If you don't cancel within the, the week or two, you get charged. So make sure to cancel it if it's not your thing. But um, if you want to watch it dubbed, you can watch that on High Dive. And that is, I believe, Fridays at yes. 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You're correct. And that is, at this point, five bucks a month. Unless you've already been subbing to High Dive for a little while now. In which case, it would be like four bucks a month. And, yeah. That's where you can find Mr. Tonegawa. Uh, you can also find Kaiji and Akagi subtitled on Crunchyroll. And the manga of Kaiji will actually be available starting early 2019 from a new publisher named Dempa Books. Huh. And that will be released in, I believe, Omnibus Volumes. I yes. want to say they mentioned hardcover, but I I don't quote me on that. In hardcover only. Okay, thank you. I mean, I mean, they could they could afford it. They are they are basically a Faku associate. They probably have a lot of money. <laughs> probably. They they got that nice Faku money. Yep. But if you'd like to know what we are up to, uh, just head on over. If this isn't like on an embedded link if we finally got the uh the audio only feed going uh you can find us on youtube.com slash uh that is also our twitter handle and our instagram and tumblr if those are your things and um i'm on where can we find you on the internet uh, you can find me on Twitter at Amonduel US. Duel has two U's in it, uh, where I talk about music and comic books and anime and that kind of thing. And speaking of music, I have a I have a dusty old song recommendation of sorts. Yay! Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't quite know any good songs about being sort of a uh, stuck in a terrible job you don't like, except for maybe Code Monkey by Jonathan Colton, which is good, but <laughs> not not quite not quite befitting this kind of. Uh, what what uh, Tonegawa's Middle Magic Blues is going for. So I'd recommend something that I think Mr. Tonegawa would listen to. Check out Asia by Steely Dan. The <laughs> favorite the favorite band by cynical middle-aged men the world over. <laughs> Ow. I feel almost a little defensive of that claim I'm on. <laughs> Look, I love Asia. I like Steely Dan. Doesn't make it less true, unfortunately. <laughs> No, no, this I mean, if, true. You, if you've been reeling in the years, then you, they're probably a favorite band of yours. Also, not not, not to speak ill of the dead, but have you seen a photo of the guys from Steely Dan? They, they looked middle-aged when they were young. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen I they were, they were, I've seen they were not hip. I, I think it was, a, I don't know what live show it was. I think it was the Midnight Hour. But yeah, they, they looked uh, well-seasoned, let's say. <laughs> a little weathered. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, Jet, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at DivineNega, where I will usually be talking about anime or cartoons or some stuff. Uh, you can also occasionally find me on my blog, Anime Infinity, where I will occasionally write about cartoons sometimes. And uh, last week, you can read some of my reviews on the Phantom Post. I'm currently reviewing season three of My Hero Academia. Nice. Uh, Noah? You can find me on Twitter at Noah Clue, where I, I talk about uh, Western animation, a global animation of all types, because I, I like to fancy myself an animation aficionado. Or if I'm not posting about cartoons, I'm probably posting pictures of my children. Um, like just the other day, Oliver decided he wanted to cook. So he I, I said, okay, we're going to put the pot on the stove. Put some water in it, turn the fire on, and we're going to add some vegetables to it. So I let him boil vegetables and add some salt to it himself. And Aww. he did not Aww. burn down the kitchen. <laughs> That's good. That was so, I was so glad about that. Of course, now he's got this mentality of like, okay, so if mom and dad aren't home, I, I can still use the fire, right? No, no, Oliver, no. no. 
It's like that one episode of The Office where Mike's like, yeah, like, um, okay, Mike, when is it safe to use, is it safe for you to use the baler? Yes, it is safe. No, 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 it's never okay for you to use this. <laughs> So that, 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 oh god, that, full circle. That's what I do with my Twitter account. I also have a, a YouTube channel, which is Journey Traveler. Um, put a pin in that one um, if I have the free time to put videos on there about animation. I want to change the world of animation discussions beyond just talking about Teen Titans Go sucking. So hopefully I'll be able to change the world with that channel. Nice. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter.com at Roots of Justice, uh, mainly just retweet cute animal pics, talk about cartoons, anime, and general fandom stuff from time to time. Yeah, it's a general good time. Why don't you come down? Say hi. Um, and as I mentioned in the Angels of Death episode, I actually do have an idea of what I want to do for my blog. Uh, stay tuned for more details on that. Cool. Uh, so, I guess at this point, um, the episode is done. Yes. In a, in a record short time, too. And uh, not quite record, but pretty short. Mm -hmm. Considering we had five and a half characters to talk about, not surprising. Uh, so, from us at Dub Talk to you, the listener, we'd like to wish you a good evening and otaku on to Dubba. <laughs> One, two, three, sink. 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 Ooh, that wasn't bad, but let's do one more for luck. We get, always got to do one more. You get two bulls in bowling. <laughs> <laughs> got to roll for that spare. Yeah. One, two, three, sink. 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 Ooh, that was perfect. All right. And that's why they call them Two Takes Freaks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh, man. That... Yeah, I got to trim that one out. <clears throat> Get it into the back this... of the episode. <laughs> I look forward to this being a very uh, serious and not at all joking episode. Oh, this, totally oh, this will be, serious. This will be just de deathly grim. No jokes to be found anywhere. This will be like a BBC documentary. All right, let me get in the zone. Like the re re really dry ones from the 70s. <laughs> back, back before Britain invented a sense of humor. Before Monty Python saved the country. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this.